All right, thank you, Birgitta Rabe, for this introduction. Uh, thank you also to the organizers of the conference and uh, to Brianna for for inviting me to, to, to give this talk. I, I was very much uh, looking forward. And uh, especially because um, I've worked now with a lot of different data sets, but uh, I'm especially fond of understanding society because um, I wrote my doctoral thesis using understanding society. And uh, actually the thesis was about um, socioeconomic differences in, in relationship dynamics. So how socioeconomic factors uh, affect uh, relationship satisfaction, divorce, and uh, so forth. Um, so today's uh, presentation is not going to be uh, that different in the sense that instead of looking at um, uh, socioeconomic factors, um, I'm going to present a little bit about uh, how sexual orientation relates uh, to relationship dynamics and especially uh, possible obstacles um, that sexual minorities might uh, encounter. So, um, ah, sorry, I was using the normal click. Okay. Um, so, um, first, I would like to um, uh, just reflect a little bit on uh, how extra how extraordinary the, the changes have been uh, uh, for for sexual minorities over the last decades. And an article that I really like that illustrates this quite well for the United States. Uh, was written by uh, Michael Rosenfeld called Moving a Mountain, the Extraordinary Trajectory of Same-Sex Marriage Approval in the United States. And in this article, uh, Rosenfeld looked at a lot of different uh, uh, attitudes towards all kinds of issues, religion, abortion, uh, drug use, uh, and so forth, and also uh, same-sex same marriage. And uh, he concluded in this article that no measured public opinion attitude in the United States has changed more and more quickly uh, than same-sex marriage. So I think this is uh, quite remarkable. And there are some extra figures in uh, his article. For instance, uh, 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 people in the United States were asked whether they knew someone who is gay or a lesbian uh, and then distinguishing between uh, as an uh, friend among friends or acquaintances, uh, co-workers and family members. And if we, for instance, compare these figures for 1985, where on, uh, only a little bit more than 20% of persons uh, indicated that they had a gay or lesbian friend or acquaintance, and now this is uh, the great majority of people, and this only happened in a, a, a time span. Of, of 25 years. And it's the same if we look at those other figure, figures of, of family members and co-workers. So I think in general, this, uh, uh, as, as, as we are all aware of, is quite a remarkable and rapid change that we've uh, been observing. And I think this, um, um, of course, was followed also by uh, a, uh, a lot of changes in, in terms of laws. And the most clear one that I'm sure everybody is uh, familiar with uh, is uh, the legalization of uh, same-sex marriage, which is, uh, has been spreading around the world and especially in the last decade in a very uh, fast rhythm. So when we uh, reflect a little bit about um, this very rapid development, I think there are a lot of different interesting questions uh, that arise, and I would like to, to just highlight a few of them. So a first question that comes to mind is how, what are the consequences for how we think about and define families? So already with changes in laws, it's very clear that these, uh, uh, that, that our thinking about uh, uh, what uh, couples or married couples in this, uh, respect are, and I think more generally that our um, thinking about uh, families is changing, and I think there are many more uh, than just uh, about marriage that uh, we might have to uh, reconsider uh, and adjust. Um, I also think that, uh, so I personally have a background in social stratification, so I'm, I'm very much interested in questions of uh, inequality of opportunity, and if we think about uh, the very 
uh, rapid changes in terms of attitudes and laws and uh, stigma and visibility of uh, sexual minorities. Uh, I think there is uh, a lot to learn in terms of how these factors affect uh, the family life of, of disadvantaged groups in society in general. And not, not just the family life, today I focus on family life, but I also am interested in socioeconomic outcomes. Um, Sil uh, Silvia will talk also a little bit about this uh, today. Um, so I think this is in general uh, and, uh, 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 raises this interesting question. But at the same time, I think uh, uh, things are changing very fast, but I think we should keep asking the questions. The question, what are uh, the remaining obstacles to family life for, for sexual minorities? And especially whether these obstacles differ between groups. And then I'm not only talking about different uh, sexual minority groups, but we can also think about whether um, these advances uh, have been equal across uh, socioeconomic strata, or whether there might be differences in the obstacles that people encounter to, uh, to, to various facets of, of family life according to ethnicity or any other uh, relevant factor. So I think these are uh, important questions that are, are coming to mind. And I just wanted to start with some of these uh, general questions in, in order that to hopefully provoke uh, uh, some thinking and uh, ideas. So, um, as I said, my background is, is in uh, social stratification and demography, kind of a little bit on the, on the intersection of both, as, as uh, was said in the introduction, I'm primarily interested in how relationships relate to, to inequality. So, uh, and I have very much a, a, a quantitative uh, background. So there has been a lot of research on same-sex couples and on uh, sexual minorities uh, uh, from a qualitative uh, point of view, but quantitative research is only uh, recently uh, really uh, becoming more common, which of course has to do a lot also with the availability of data that I will talk a little bit about. So, um, uh, if we uh, look at this body of literature uh, in the fields of, of, of demography and uh, of, of quantitative sociology, uh, there are a few questions that I think uh, summarize uh, important parts of, of, of these literatures uh, within these disciplines that I am uh, more familiar with. So uh, first question, of course, relates to measurement. And this is something that I will uh, go uh, into detail about a little bit more. Uh, kind of the first half of, of this presentation today. So how can we quantitatively measure uh, same-sex couples and how about uh, sexual minorities in general? Um, there, is, uh, there are bodies of literature that are basically uh, uh, concerned with very basic demographic questions, such as how many same-sex couples and families are there? And uh, a lot of the first studies have kind of, uh, uh, when we talk about family life, have kind of talked about whether uh, the dynamics within same-sex couples are different from those uh, uh, within uh, different sex couples or not. So for instance, there are a lot of studies uh, on homogamy, to what extent uh, uh, partners within same-sex couples are more similar to each other uh, than within different sex couples. Um, and then there's also a big literature on parenting. So Sylvia will um, present a little bit about that later. So I will not talk much about that. I do have a paper about it and worked a little bit on it. So this was one of the, um, well, I will leave this uh, for Sylvia to, to explain. Um, so, uh, and I think there's a, a, a new literature, at least uh, for social stratification scholars, and uh, in quantitative sociology in Europe, at least, uh, which asked the questions of how external factors such as attitudes, discrimination, and laws affect the relationships and well being of individuals in, in, in same sex couples. So, there are actually a lot of studies about this uh, in public health. There are uh, studies about this in, in, in family studies, but more from a, a, a social stratification point of view, there is very little. So actually, uh, the project that I just started uh, has its, as its main objective to kind of um, uh, look at these contextual factors uh, uh, and how uh, societal factors can influence family life uh, and the relationships more generally of, of individuals in same-sex couples. 
All right, so um, this is just to give a little bit uh, to place kind of uh, today's talk within the more general uh, body of, of, of literature that, that I'm familiar with. I would like to say there are many different bodies of literature out there and I would be happy also if you feel like I'm, if, if you're working in one of these bodies of literature and you feel like I, I, uh, I haven't been, I should have been discussing uh, a field of study, please do let me know and I'm, I'm very happy to to learn about those uh, those studies. So I think this is uh, also a first thing that I would like to say when it comes to um, uh, more conceptual and measurement issues. So uh, as this is an emerging topic in many different fields, um, uh, studying same-sex couples and sexual minorities more generally is done in a lot of different uh, uh, fields of study. And uh, uh, a lot of the things that I've been learning, they come from very different uh, disciplines in very different fields. So, uh, and a lot of that that I've been learning, especially uh, conceptually, comes from uh, gender and sexuality uh, studies. So, they have actually been already talking a lot about uh, how we could quantitatively measure uh, um, sexual orientation, uh, same sex couples, and, uh, and so forth. So uh, I think it's important that uh, to start first with these um, conceptual issues, and this is kind of a little bit, a little a short summary of what is my reading of that uh, body of literature and how I think we could, we could use this to study some of the questions that I've been outlining before. Uh, so I think there are two uh, important challenges. Um, the first is a more general question about how we construct quantitative categories for sexual minority populations. And the second uh, one is more related with, with, uh, uh, with measurement and samples. I see there's a typo there, I'm sorry. How to quantitatively study a population that is relatively small in number. So I will get back to that uh, after uh, uh, the first more uh, conceptual issues. So let me start by the most common way in which uh, 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 um, same-sex couples uh, are studied or uh, measured or identified in data sets. So uh, normally this is basically uh, done by matching information on the sex of the respondent and the sex of the partner. And if the sex uh, of the respondent and of the partner match uh, and uh, uh, they indicate, as we see here in, 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 in this form from the 2011 census, we see there's questions about the sex of each individual in the household, and there's information about how each person is related. So if, uh, um, uh, both, if there are persons who indicate that they are partners or same-sex partners, husband or wife, and they both indicate the same sex, uh, we mark them as uh, same-sex couples. So there are a, a couple of, there are measurement issues that I will get back to later, but there are also some uh, conceptual issues uh, or some limitations to this approach. So first of all, of course, if we're interested in, in family life or in relationships or uh, in any, any facet of, of romantic life, so to say, uh, we, we, we also might want to uh, include single persons. So how do we include uh, single persons if uh, we, our identification of, 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 of individuals is based only on those who, who are in couples. So this kind of puts forward uh, uh, um, a more general question of how do we quantitatively identify sexual minorities in general. So uh, just uh, in terms of def definitions, when I talk about sexual minorities, I talk about individuals whose uh, sexual identity, uh, behavior, or attractions um, are different from heterosexual norms. Um, so, um, so I think uh, when we talk about same-sex couples and we talk about family life, automatically the, the, the question follows, how do we uh, measure or identify sexual minorities uh, in, in data sets? Um, there are some related problems uh, 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 in, uh, when we only look at same-sex couples. There are also individuals in different sex couples who identify uh, as a sexual minority. For instance, uh, bisexual individuals might be in a different sex couple and still identify as a sexual minority. Um, 
An important thing that also emerges from this uh, 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 literature on gender and sexuality is that the experiences of different sexual minority groups might be very different. Uh, and this is something that if we just look at same-sex couples is something that we, we cannot really uh, take into account. Um, if we uh, do not only talk about uh, uh, sexual orientation, but if we also talk more generally, uh, if we think of, about the LGBTQ, uh, plus community, uh, we might also wonder about uh, gender minorities and to what extent uh, they are not part of our studies when we just focus on, on, on same-sex couples. Uh, already one problem when we consider gender minorities. So with gender minorities, uh, I mean individuals whose gender identity uh, are different from uh, 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 norms about uh, uh, gender in society. So. Uh, we can think of uh, transgender persons, non-binary persons, genderqueer persons. So already, if we think about uh, uh, these same-sex couples and how they are identified in data, we already see here, for instance, in the 2001 census question that uh, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, when there's the question about sex, this is not uh, inclusive of um, uh, gender minorities, and it's also not made clear whether, for instance, this refers to um, sex assigned at birth or uh, uh, whether this refers to gender identity. In the 2021 census, as I will show later, there there is um, uh, there are more options in that in that regard. But uh, that is very rare, uh, unfortunately, so far in the data sets, and the same accounts for for understanding uh, society. So I think these are important uh, uh, limitations that we should uh, keep in mind. Oh, sorry. Um, so uh, understanding society there uh, also has a different way of, uh, when we think about this question, how do we uh, identify um, sexual minorities in data sets? Uh, we also have other questions uh, at our disposal. So in different ways of uh, understanding society, there are questions about uh, sexual orientation or uh, sexual identity uh, to be more precise. So I think it's wave three and wave nine where everybody is asked in five and seven only of, of, uh, parts of the sample. So um, the question there is, which of the following options best describes how you think of yourself? And the answer options are heterosexual or straight, gay or lesbian, bisexual, other, and there's also an option uh, prefer not to say, which is uh, different from, from uh, refused, it's actually offered as an option. Uh, so um, what are the limitations? Uh, so I think uh, this is a nice addition to the, the Understanding Society data, um, but there are also some uh, limitations um, that we have to uh, take into account when we use uh, these kind of measures. So um, uh, we have to ask the question, how about individuals who do not identify with the labels of the answer options uh, provided? So the answer options provided are gay or lesbian, bisexual, heterosexual, straight. Um, but especially if we take into account that uh, gender is non-binary, uh, uh, not everybody might identify uh, with the labels gay, lesbian, or bisexual, for instance. Um, Furthermore, um, so there are a lot of, if we take into account all the different kinds of uh, uh, sexual identities that, that are out there, they go far beyond uh, uh, the, the categories that are here. Uh, queer, pansexual, just to name uh, a few of them. Um, also, um, uh, there are uh, some qualitative studies that have shown that the meaning of certain uh, sexual identity labels uh, might differ also between social economic and uh, ethnic groups. So within certain ethnic and social economic groups, the, the label gay might primarily refer um, uh, to a white uh, educated um, identity. Um, all right, so I think um, uh, I can go into detail into, uh, um, uh, about this a little bit further ahead. But I think one important uh, uh, thing to take into account is also that sexual identity uh, can change over time. So um, right now we have two measurement points where people are asked in uh, understanding society and actually the whole 
sample is asked again in wave nine. So both in wave three and wave nine, wave nine individuals are asked about their sexual identity. So we can get some insight into this uh, uh, from there, but this is also something uh, um, to be aware of. All right, so this was just an example uh, in the in the in the how in the census. So so I think uh, later I will talk about why I think understanding society offers a lot of uh, possibilities. Uh, but I think the census uh, 2021 might also um, uh, offer a lot of opportunities. As uh, if I understood correctly, um, this is uh, they include questions about sexual identity and also about gender identity. So I think some very basic questions and demographic questions we might get really uh, precise answers about them uh, soon for the UK. All right, I'm just... Ah, okay, so here I just have a big... So I learned so much from these studies that I just wanted to put them on a slide and acknowledge all these studies. Uh, so if you uh, think that what I've just talked about is something that you would uh, uh, like to dive into, just take a screenshot right now. And I very much uh, recommend these studies. As I said, they come from very different fields that I'm used to, but I learned uh, uh, a lot from them. And then, uh, um, so I quickly wanted to mention them at the very least. Okay, so, um, um, those were conceptual issues, but there are actually also uh, some measurement issues. And when we talk about the demographic literature, well, okay, this came out very pixely. Uh, but, uh, so um, there are also actually some measurement issues and actually in the demographic and, and, and sociological, quantitative sociological literature, there has actually been most attention or a lot, a lot of attention has been going out to, to this issue. So uh, this is an issue that has uh, to do or um, uh, uh, with uh, studying populations that are very small in number. So um, a lot of studies have found and they've actually shown by cross-checking different data sets that uh, even uncommon coding errors on sex and relationship variables can lead to a large share of same-sex unions in a data set consisting of miscoded different sex unions. So of course we have to be careful here because um, even uh, we might find combinations of information in our data that we think might be inconsistent but they could very well uh, reflect uh, reality. But uh, I think there are uh, a lot of studies that have shown that in a lot of um, instances, there are actually simple mistakes uh, made in terms of just ticking, accidentally tickling another box than, uh, uh, than you intended to tick. Or, uh, and this can lead, um, uh, especially in the case of uh, uh, sex and relationship variables, what can happen in that case is that we have, uh, let's just say, a different sex couple and somebody accidentally ticks another um, uh, gender answer option than intended and therefore this different sex uh, union ends up being coded as a same sex union. Um, I will later show you, uh, so let me maybe go there first. Um, so there's actually a very nice study by Renier Lollier. So in, in Europe, uh, I would like to say also in US, in the US this literature, uh, the literature about uh, sexual minorities is much more extensive than in Europe, uh, but in Europe, there are also, uh, 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 especially at INET, uh, uh, people that have been uh, working on this issue. And this is a paper by Renier Lollier, who kind of shows theoretically how much of an influence this kind of uh, miscoding uh, can have on our samples. So here we see in, in this table from, from the article, uh, a theoretical example of effects of coding error on the observation of same-sex couples. So if we assume that even only in 1% uh, of the cases, uh, the variable sex has been kind of miscoded, uh, this would not really matter for different sex couples because we only, only have, if we start with a sample of 20,000 of which 19,900 are, are different sex couples and 1% gets miscoded, we get 199 miscoded couples, which is only 0.01% of the complete sample. However, um, we also, if uh, uh, um, 
we also, in this simulation, if 1% of, of uh, sex coding error exists, we get 99 uh, different sex couples who are coded as ex kind of accidentally coded as uh, same sex couples. And this would uh, result in uh, uh, quite a high percentage of same sex couples actually being uh, miscoded different sex couples. So this is kind of an issue that uh, uh, especially in, in the US and also in some, uh, uh, for instance, in, in this data regards to gender and generation survey, uh, uh, has uh, has been an obstacle uh, sometimes to come uh, to work with data sets. So just if this issue is not very clear to you yet, so this is an example that I found myself in the American Community Survey. So here we have a household where we have uh, a woman of 83 years old uh, 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 who is widowed and the head of the household. And we actually see that uh, this person lives with a 53 year old divorced woman and with a 20 year old man and a 21 year old woman who uh, both are never married. And the, the 20 year old man is the grandchild of the head of the household. And so actually the unmarried partner option in this data set was actually intended for unmarried partners of the head of the household because it asks about the relationship to the head of the household. But I think for instance, in this example, it's uh, more likely that uh, this person is actually the unmarried partner of the grandchild. So here, um, if we would just follow the rules of relation, combining information about relationship status and uh, sex, this would be coded as a same-sex couple of the 83-year-old woman with a 20-year-old uh, with a 20-year-old woman. Um, so. I, uh, this is something that we have to take into account. Um, and uh, when I started working with the understanding society uh, data, I started looking into what extent there could be issues here uh, uh, in, in the understanding the society data. So one of the recommendations that has been made based on this body of literature is to have an explicit option where when we talk about relationship status, as this is the understanding since society I think relationship uh, status options, and there is uh, an explicit option uh, for registered same-sex uh, civil partnerships. Uh, but normally, it's also recommended to have uh, an option of uh, having uh, uh, a same living as a couple as number ten, but uh, uh, explicitly stating that you're living as a couple with a same-sex partner. Because this kind of uh, since then we have more than one source of information. To identifying same-sex couples, this can reduce this type of, of, of measurement error. Um, so uh, uh, even though this is partly resolved for civil partnerships, uh, for living as a couple, this is not clear, and for married individuals, uh, uh, also not. Um, so in the BHPS, there were even uh, less options available. However, at the same time, um, um, I, I think we can be uh, quite confident uh, uh, that in, the, in, in understanding society, uh, um, most of the same-sex couples, if we would simply combine information uh, uh, on sex and on relationship status, that most of them are actually uh, same-sex couples. And this is why, because here, uh, this is a very first result where we simply see the percentage of partnered persons, so either living in a couple or uh, married, uh, and uh, including the registered uh, civil partnership. So the per percentage of part partnered persons who is in a same-sex couple. And here we see that uh, uh, actually, and this is a nice feature of, of, of understanding society because we can of course, uh, for a lot of variables, go back in time very much uh, using the BHPS too. So actually we see that in, B in the BHPS, we have a very small uh, percentage of partnered persons in the same sex couple uh, below 0 0.2 in the, in the first year. And we see that it steadily uh, goes up over time with uh, a percentage that is close to 1.2 in recent years, which is six times more than uh, in the 90s. So I don't think this reflects a, an enormous increase in, in miscoding, especially uh, given the attention that there has been for, for this topic. Um, uh, I rather, so I think we can safely assume that maybe in the 90s, a large share of these couples might have been miscoded couples, I think, 
uh, by now this should not be uh, as big a share as, as, as in the past anymore. Um, all right, so some other things that these studies, for instance, have looked at is information on uh, marriage and uh, having children. Uh, okay, I'm just waiting for the slides to... Okay, let me just go first to marriage and children before I go back to this. So uh, a lot of these studies have normally cross-checked information about marriage. So normally, since marriage must, was not legal for same-sex couples, it was kind of assumed, and you actually saw that in some data sets, that if there was a huge share of married couples, that uh, the likelihood that these were miscoded was kind of larger. In understanding society, I think this might have been uh, uh, recoded afterwards, because we see that except in very early years for um, uh, women in same-sex couples, these are just a handful uh, that are married that we see from the 2000s and, uh, until 2014, that there are none that uh, have been uh, coded as marriages. So I'm not sure if this is uh, because the data quality is, is uh, super high or uh, because this has been uh, recoded later. But I do think uh, actually, so, so this is how I'm going to proceed. I'm going to present some data from, from understanding society and BHPS. And I think there are already interesting results emerging from simply the exploration of the data. So I think uh, we already see that they're actually close to half uh, of same-sex couples are already uh, married uh, by uh, 2019, which is I think the last year I included here. So um, another thing that uh, these studies have checked is to look at the number of children. So um, data sets that have found a lot of kind of miscoded uh, different sex couples as same sex couples in their data set also found very large shares of uh, same sex couples with children. And actually in understanding society and in the BHPS, this is not the case. Here we see the absolute count of couples with co-residing children under 16 uh, in understanding society and the BHPS. So these numbers are really small. Actually, in terms of percentages, they're also uh, uh, very, uh, very low. So this is, uh, of course, uh, not good news from one perspective, but in terms of the data, um, uh, a measurement perspective, uh, this kind of uh, leads us to, uh, to expect that uh, most same-sex couples uh, in the understanding society uh, data might indeed be uh, same-sex couples. So um, here I started talking about um, uh, counts of same-sex couples. And for that, I would like to go just back to this earlier slide. And here we see the absolute number of individuals and couples uh, in understanding society and the BHPS uh, that can be found. So here I used uh, all the enumerated uh, or all the individuals that are in the in all file. Uh, since we're in understanding society conference, I think I can use these terms. Um, so here we see that uh, you see this huge jump in 2009, which is of course when uh, understanding society started. So we see that in the BHPS, there are very few uh, uh, individuals in same-sex couples and same-sex couples in general, but in uh, uh, recent years we have around 300 individuals in uh, uh, understanding society and around 100 coming from around 150 couples. So uh, compared to some, if you've been using a lot of big quantitative data sets, this is not spectacular, but I think this is uh, uh, acceptable. Um, for a lot of questions. So I think uh, uh, one nice thing that emerges from, from, uh, from, from, uh, from this data is that we can actually, uh, or this is a main strength of using understanding society for looking at these questions, which is that normally most bigger data sets, like for instance, annual population uh, survey or the censuses or other data sets, you cannot really go back in time that long. And Combining understanding society and BHPS, we can go back in time quite far. Uh, most studies that I've seen, they start maybe in 2010. So we might actually uh, uh, miss a big part of development. So understanding society is very uh, nice for that. So here we actually see that until 2010, uh, women in same-sex couples were uh, not very visible in, um, uh, uh, in 
in the statistics, various, uh, uh, but this has increased a lot uh, over time. Okay, I'm just waiting for the slides to respond to the clicker. Okay, um, so as I showed before, uh, there, there are very few uh, in absolute numbers. Okay, the slides are probably going to, to be moving a little bit while I talk, but I would just like to say, uh, in terms of absolute sample size, there are relatively few children uh, living uh, with same-sex couples. So probably if you have those kind of questions in mind, this is not the, the best uh, data set to use, but that's why we can listen to Sylvia uh, later. Um, so I have prepared some basic trends, but I would like to move forward to uh, uh, the next topic. So I think this is one uh, first thing that I wanted to highlight uh, is that Understanding Society is a nice resource to look at uh, longer time trends that even though the sample size is relatively small, uh, we can go back in time quite far. All right, so um, then I uh, wanted to give a little bit of an introduction to the sexual identity uh, measures. Um, so here we kind of see uh, answers that uh, are, are given to sexual identity questions in the two ways where they're asked about. So among uh, men, um, we see uh, around 2% who, who answer gay. Uh, among women, we see that bisexual is relatively uh, common. And we also see uh, quite uh, around two and a half, three percent of persons uh, refusing. Um, all right, let me just skip that. Um, so I think there's one very nice feature that uh, we can do now. As I uh, 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 explained before in the introduction, when we look at same-sex couples, uh, we cannot look at singles. And I think this uh, combination of information about sexual identity and understanding society data uh, does allow us to look at sexual minorities who are uh, single. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so actually here we see the share of uh, individuals who is either in a co-residential uh, relationship or in a non-residential relationship. So the question for non-residential relationship is, do you have a steady relationship with someone you are not living with here, whom you think of as your partner? And we think that in general, non-residential relationships have increased a lot for the whole sample. Uh, but we actually see that when we take this into account for women, uh, uh, that they are uh, more likely to be in a relationship, uh, 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 that lesbian and bisexual women are more likely to be in a relationship than women who are identify as heterosexual. And I think an important uh, message that emerges kind of from this picture, that if we look at the 2017 figure for uh, lesbian women, for instance, is that a really big uh, share of lesbian women are actually in non-residential uh, uh, steady relationships. And I think uh, when we think about studying uh, family life uh, and relationships, uh, um, uh, we, we should take this into account that a lot of uh, this actually happens outside of uh, co-residential unions. So this seems to be the case for, 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 the, for, the, for the population in general, as we see it happening for all groups. But this might especially be the case if we're interested in uh, the family life of uh, sexual minorities. Okay, this is for men. Uh, I don't have much time left, so I wanted to okay, uh, just uh, move a little bit forward. I think I can skip this because this should be in Andrew's uh, uh, presentation. So thanks, that saves me a little bit of time. So uh, let me just go to the last part of the presentation that I, I, I wanted to go to. And I think this is, um, so I think Understanding society has uh, some very nice features in terms of uh, going back uh, a, a lot in time. It is a very rich data set. It allows us to study uh, singles. Uh, there are so many questions about non-residential partners and so forth. So I think it's a great data set. But I think, uh, especially when it comes to mechanisms, and if we kind of want to understand 
uh, which factors affect the socioeconomic outcomes, health outcomes, uh, relationship quality, relationship outcomes. I think uh, understanding society is such a rich data set that there's really a lot uh, that we can do with the data from that perspective. So here there are already some studies that I found uh, very interesting that uh, used understanding society to look at these kind of uh, questions. So um, myself, uh, together with Daniela Mignoli, um, we asked the question, uh, uh, to what extent uh, the legalization of same-sex marriage mattered for the well-being of, of, of individuals in same-sex couples. So we decided to do this originally with the animal population survey, because the animal population survey is bigger than understanding society. And actually, you see in this graph, this is based on uh, three and a half thousand individuals in same-sex couples. So you're not going to get to this sample sizes using understanding society. But understanding society, of course, has a lot of extra features. So um, what we did in this study was to look at an index of subjective well-being, which was based on four questions. I think, uh, how, how anxious did you feel yesterday? How happy were you yesterday? Uh, do you feel that things are worthwhile doing in life? Are you satisfied with your life? So this was an index of, 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 of well-being. And we looked at how this developed over time. So in England, uh, Wales, and Scotland, in, or in England and Wales, uh, uh, in, in March 2014, same-sex marriage got legalized. So kind of our question was, uh, do we see that uh, with same-sex marriage being legalized, do we see that the well-being of individuals in same-sex couples changes? So there are two major reasons to think uh, why this might be the case. First of all, uh, marriage uh, provides certain institutional benefits. It might uh, provide some security to relationships in terms of uh, fixing or relatively fixing uh, future plans. Um, but also uh, uh, the legalization of same-sex marriage is also the abolishment of um, uh, a form of uh, institutional discrimination. So this can also more broadly have an effect of, uh, uh, on, on the uh, well-being of, of sexual minorities uh, more generally. So this is actually what we also uh, observe in our data. So what we see in this, uh, in, in this dashed line here is the, the, the well-being of, of individuals in different sex couples. And the, the solid line is uh, the well-being of individuals in same-sex couples. So here we observed in the animal population survey that the well-being of individuals in, in same-sex couples was actually declining uh, before 2014, whereas it was going up for individuals in different sex couples. And we see that uh, it significantly increased in uh, 2014 and uh, 2015. So the trend kind of uh, turned around. Um, what we observed also in this data was that um, uh, individuals who are in a marriage uh, uh, have higher uh, subjective well-being as compared to individuals who are um, uh, in informally uh, cohabiting. Um, but what we actually saw, um, next slide please. Um, is that we see more broadly that the subjective well-being of uh, individuals in same-sex couples uh, increased regardless of marital status. So it increased for individuals in civil partnership until 2014 and, and civil partnership or marriage after that. But especially if we focus on the blue line, individuals in informal cohabiting unions, their subjective well-being increased too. So one of the questions that we, uh, or one of the conclusions that we kind of drew from this was that uh, uh, it might indeed be that the abolishment of this um, uh, uh, part of institutional discrimination might have improved the subject of well-being of individuals in, in same-sex couples more generally. So of course, now uh, when I started diving into understanding society data, I was wondering, okay, uh, and this is, uh, I think every researcher, this is a very nerve wracking moment. So I, I decided to see, can I replicate this uh, using understanding society? So I did this uh, a couple of weeks ago. So this is uh, kind of preliminary. And here we see uh, the results. Next slide, please. Um, when we do this, 
for relationship satisfaction in understanding society. So one of the nice things about understanding society is that we can get a little bit closer to the measures uh, that we're actually interested in. So we were looking at subjective well-being before, but we can imagine that uh, if we think, for instance, about uh, same-sex marriage, that it especially can impact uh, relationship uh, quality. And in this case, there's this question in understanding society, how happy you are with your relationship on a scale from one to seven. And we see this similar uh, jump in uh, 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 happiness with relationship uh, in this case, for individuals uh, in same-sex couples, exactly in, um, in the same year. Okay, thanks. So um, then I decided also to look at how this looks like. So I think this is a, a, a general nice thing to do with understanding society data in general. So uh, I could also replicate this using uh, the identity data uh, that was collected in 2011, 2012. So I started there and I looked at how, depending on how uh, individuals identified in 2011 and 2012, how did their happiness with the relationship develop? And uh, we actually see that uh, both for individuals uh, identifying as gay or lesbian and individuals uh, who answered other to the sexual identity questions, we see a significant increase in uh, uh, relationship satisfaction between 2014 and 2015. All right, so I tried to look a little bit more into mechanisms, but there it, well, it started getting a little bit blurry. I just have a few um, uh, minutes left. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to uh, 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 just move forward. Here is also just some acknowledgments to some of the uh, uh, the scholars who uh, have been working on these and similar topics uh, before me and from whom I've learned uh, a lot. So uh, please take a screenshot and read uh, their articles if you don't know them uh, yet. Um, so I just would like to um, conclude. Next, please. Okay, thanks. Um, so the conclusion or the general discussion that I would like to uh, provide is that studying the family life of same-sex couples and sexual minority groups in general has specific challenges, but it opens up many relevant questions. And I think understanding society can be an important source to study the family life of sexual minorities. So it's not the, even though it's a huge data set for many of us, it's not that big compared with other data sets that have been used in this uh, field of study. So, for instance, if we think of censuses, registry data, uh, annual population survey, the, the sample is not as big, but the advantage is that we can look at changes over time. There's also questions about sexual identity. Um, I didn't have much time to talk about this, but I would just like to say that the other category is uh, very uh, um, complicated to interpret, uh, but very important to look at because uh, it might be that the most disadvantaged sexual minorities might actually have answered uh, this option. Of course, a major feature that I want to exploit are the longitudinal features of, of understanding society. But here, um, so I tried to, to get some results based on the kind of longitudinal questions that we ask. But here, uh, I would like to warn that sample size can become a little bit of an issue since we are starting to rely on changes within individuals which means less variation, which means uh, 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 less precision. But this is definitely something uh, to explore. OK, this is the last slide. So uh, in terms of substantive discussion, uh, okay, I didn't have time uh, to talk about all of this, but I would just like to highlight uh, that I think that uh, these results from understanding, these very preliminary results from understanding society already show that uh, Non-residential unions are very important when we study uh, the family life uh, or family life in general, and especially family life of sexual minorities. Uh, and I think uh, uh, there is some extra evidence that institutional discrimination impacts the relationships of sexual minorities. And I think a next question would be to ask uh, how about other forms uh, of discrimination? Uh, does this differ between socioeconomic and ethnic groups and so forth? 
And of course, uh, any of uh, the questions that or suggestions that you might have and that I would be uh, very happy to hear. So yeah, thank you very much. Let me just acknowledge uh, my funding and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward, especially to the talks of Andrew and Sylvia and, uh, and to your questions afterwards. Thank you.